Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Marty Fulton with the SNEA Solid State Storage Initiative, and I'm pleased to be the moderator for our presentation today, How to Be a Part of the Real World Workload Revolution. And I did practice saying that many times. We can go to the next slide. I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have some great speakers today. We have Eden Kim, who's the chair of the Solid State Storage Technical Work Group at SNEA which is working on workload and performance testing of solid state drives and persistent memory. They've done extensive work with performance test specifications and which are viewed and used by the industry and customers. Eden is also the CEO of Calypso Systems, a leading solid state drive test vendor. Also here today presenting is Jim Fister, who's a principal at the Decision Place, who provides consulting services for businesses. Jim manages the Persistent Memory Hackathon program at SNEA, which provides better understanding of how to use existing APIs to program persistent memory. And he also supports the SNEA Solid State Storage Initiative on SSD and persistent memory education, like this webcast today. So we can go to the next slide. Just a few legal points. So just to note that the material here is copyrighted by SNEA, unless otherwise noted, and the information presented presented represents the author's personal opinion and is not really subject to any legal uh, responsibility or, or issues. Let's go to the next slide. You probably already know about SNEA, 185 industry-leading organizations with 2,000 active contributing members. Jim and Eden are examples of that. And we provide uh, services, education, and services to 50,000 end users uh, worldwide. So there's three things before I turn it over to Jim that I'd like you to remember. First, I would encourage you to learn more about SNEA and the educational library of 7,000 videos, presentations, and white papers. You can access that through SNEA.org. Second, don't forget to click the button on your display screen to ask questions during the presentation. Jim and Eden are going to try to answer them during the presentation, but if we don't get to them, you'll see all the Q&A on our blog, as SNEA Solid State blog. And then the third question, the, very, the question that we always get in every presentation is, how do I get the slides? So the last slide of this webcast will have a link to the slides, a link to the blog for the Q&A, and also links to um, the workload white paper in English and Chinese that provides additional information. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Thanks, Jim. And thank you, Marty. So uh, welcome, everybody, to the webcast. Uh, today's agenda uh, that we're going to cover in the next 50 minutes, we're going to, to discuss real-world workloads and their comparison to synthetic workloads. We'll be talking about measuring and visualizing real-world workloads, including a demonstration. Uh, we'll discuss some of the testing and sharing that we can do and the benefits of joining the real-world workload program. So for, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Eden to get started on. Uh, and tell me, Eden, what is a real-world workload? OK, so from a 100,000-foot level, by the way, hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, what are real-world workloads? Just simply put, a real-world workload is a workload that occurs in the real world when you're doing something on a computer. And they're distinguished from the traditional synthetic lab workloads in the following ways. Number one, they are a constantly changing sequence of IO stream combinations and QDEPs. So what that means is that when you look at a real-world workload, a lot of different IO streams occur, and they change from moment to moment. So unlike a synthetic lab workload, which is a fixed and constant workload like a random 4K write or a sequential 128K read, a real-world workload can be comprised of tens, hundreds, even thousands of discrete I.O. streams. And those combinations change from moment to moment. And also, the demand intensity or Q depth or user level also changes. So that gives you a good sense of a, of a real-world workload and what they are. And uh, you did, by the way, hear from our fourth presenter, Eden Stodd, my the fifth and sixth presenters, my two might join in at some point or another as well. Let's actually look at synthetic versus real-world workloads. Um, if you, if you, because most of the time when we when we look in the industry, uh, we see that there's a synthetic workload that's generated that's used for most of the testing. And uh, one that I think is. Uh, uh, one, uh, one, of, one of the things that I think is important to understand is that 
a synthetic workload actually is a pretty useful tool in terms of being able to test your uh, test your environment. But a real world workload is going to really tell you how the uh, how the system is truly performing. I did get a note that the audio is echoing. Uh, we'll see if we can uh, address that as we go. Um, so typically, if you look at a synthetic SQL workload, uh, you, uh, you'll you see that listed as basically a 65-35 read-write ratio with limited I.O. threads and uh, and fitting into the uh, write, reading and writing to storage. And uh, so and, and those are typically defined as 8K read and write. You can actually see on the diagram here that an actual real-world workload, while the read-write ratio is similar, it is different, 7228. So it actually is a little more read-heavy. Um, although, look at some of the other characteristics. 10% of our measured workloads were 8K reads. 2.8% um, of them were 8K writes. So there was a significant amount of additional read-write uh, read or read-write streams. And then over 5,000 unique I.O. streams were actually observed while we were doing the workload. And that's just the start of it. You're all, you also need to factor in all the additional things going on in the system, such as the backup. And that's going to change your different characteristics as well. So basically, as you look at it, uh, we need to really understand what a real-world workload is going to do and how it's going to impact the system. Eden, what else would you have to say about that? So if we're talking about a typical synthetic workload for SQL Server being a random 8K 6535 rewrite mix. So in addition to not just being random 8K I.O. streams, even though a workload may be read dominant, for example, a 90-10 read-write ratio, it might be 100% read for a long period of time and then 100% write during morning boot store. So one has to be very careful by just assuming that a top-level description, such as a random 8K read-dominant workload, is going to always provide you with reads and 8K rewrites. Absolutely, and that's the big difference between a real world and a synthetic workload. So understanding why those are so important, um, it, it starts to become pretty obvious, especially as we start to look at solid-state per storage performance. Um, the performance of the individual solid-state drive or the solid-state memory is going to depend in large part on, the, on what the software workload is really doing. So these real-world workloads are going to be composed of dynamically changing combinations of I.O. streams, as we were just discussing. And we're going to need to really understand how to best tune the system to be able to support the actual content as, as well as anything else. Um, the I.O. stream content is going to affect your different optimization and design. And we'll actually start to discuss how that's going to impact not only the designs of the drives themselves, but also the design of the software and the design of the system that IT actually is going to deploy in the end. And they're going to change with the various levels of software abstraction. So even we do have a question here. Shouldn't real-world workloads have concurrent application, uh, have concurrent applications also, any SQL workloads are also logging or journaling sequential writes. What do you have to say about that? That's a very good question. So in fact, when we see all of these different I.O. streams, they represent all of the activity going from point A to point B. So while we are interested in, for example, SQL Server read-write backup or some other activity, you will see I.O. streams associated with every software activity that's occurring on the system. So when we look at process IDs, or PIDs that are associated with an I.O., you will see many associated with SQL Server, but just as many with system and other application or processes that are going on. So that's one of the reasons why when you want to look at a workload and optimize your software, one wants to know what exactly is in there, and one wants to know what the effect that different applications have while you're running your workload. You're, realistically, as you look at this workload, we, we want to measure it as a collection of I.O. streams that are actually seen directly by the storage. These are going to be generated in application space and also generated at the OS level, but most of them will be generated in the app space and then passed through uh, various levels in the system. And this will be done during real-world computer usage. So there will be interrupts, there will be additional traffic, there will be backups, all the other things that we want to look at. 
So let's move forward with some definitions so that we can uh, so that we can get to a common understanding of what we want to discuss here. So from the perspective of an I/O stream, uh, we're going to define that uh, as input/output operation that has unique, either random or sequential access, unique block size as well as data transfer size. Um, it is a unique read or write. Uh, and has its own uh, defined define specific queue depth. So a single I.O. stream is going to be able to uh, occur many times uh, during any capture that we're going to do. But we can measure a lot of the secondary characteristics around that. Uh, you can see that we can chart a variety of different uh, pieces of information with the tool that, uh, that uh, we're providing uh, free of use for uh, any of you take, uh, looking at the class here. And we want to be able to get you to understand all the different capabilities of the I.O. stream. So Eden, anything to add there? So here's an important distinction that we should be aware of. What's the difference between an I.O. capture and an I.O. trace capture? I'm sure everyone is familiar with I.O. traces, and they're interesting because it takes all of the data that occurs and collects it, and you get this huge stack of a very, very large data file. An I.O. capture actually doesn't take any data. It parses the data into steps, time steps, one second, one millisecond, 100 milliseconds, and it takes statistics on all the I.O. streams observed during that step. So instead of collecting and saving all the humongous data, you're actually collecting statistics on the I.O. steps. This allows you to do a broad, long-term capture without having a huge file. So for example, if we did an I.O. trace capture, a 10-minute activity, you might have a 10 terabyte file. On the other hand, you could do a 24-hour capture at a 10-second resolution and have maybe a 50-megabyte file with an I.O. capture. So the I.O. capture allows you to capture a long duration of activity to see what the key I.O. streams are and to be able to easily and portably administer the capture without having to worry about the huge file size and the taking of actual personal data or other data that might be on the source server. Yeah, and we certainly can't emphasize that enough. The the way that we want to really uh, build and, and set our, our, our I.O. performance analysis is really done off of data type rather than actual data. So like Eden said, the tool that we're using here is actually capturing, well, okay, we did a 7.8K read, and if you want to replay that at some point or another, uh, that can be done with dummy data uh, rather than actually having to capture the data itself. So an I.O. capture, uh, again, as we, as we were talking about it, so this is the tabulation of the statistics on the I.O. streams. So we're going to be able to gather the statistics and metrics. Uh, it, as we've already said, it's not an I.O. trace. And uh, what we're going to really do is capture the binary numeric, uh, or, or capture and report as a binary numeric table. Um, so this is a great way for uh, us to be able to get all the information that we want do it in a compact form, as Eden was referencing, and uh, and then successfully replay that. If you look at how that is generated within the software stack, the software stack itself is going, you know, we're referring to that as the layers of the different software. So that's going to be OS, your API, your programs, all the different abstractions and drivers in the system that are going to exist between the user space, space and the storage. So most of your I.O. Uh, activities are actually generated in user space. Uh, the OS will generate some, as, as will others, but the majority of your streams are going to be generated in the user space, especially the ones that we're going to be tracking on the traces here. And they will have to uh, transverse the software stack in a variety of ways, moving through drivers, moving through APIs, sometimes moving back and forth before they actually move to the storage unit itself. And uh, therefore, the composition is going to be different at different levels of the stack, and the, and the drive itself, as it sees these coming in, is going to be seeing the real-world activity coming from application, coming from OS, coming from all the different areas. And that's why a real-world workload is um, so much more important than a synthetic workload. Because a synthetic workload is going to say, well, here's how I'm generating it at the application or user space. But we have to understand all the variances that are going to occur in, in the area. Um, so, uh, Eden, anything more to say on that? And then we can address another question. 
Well, just going to the question, um, it's a very good question. Isn't latency a key performance metric for these workloads? So collecting only two-minute bursts might not show latency anomalies. So when we track the IOs, we tabulate statistics on every IO observed. And we record the IOPS, the response times, the quality of service, uh, a whole bunch of different uh, metrics. While the IO step could be one second, we might average and collect all of the IOs that occur over that one second and have 10,000 individual IOs and their latency measurements for each I.O. As far as burstiness is concerned, here you're concerned with the temporal occurrence of the I.O.s to see when the I.O. activity is bursting and when there's idle times. So in order to catch I.O. bursts, you want to have a finer resolution of time steps. So instead of being at one second, you would probably want to record at maybe not one microsecond, but maybe 100 milliseconds and you would be able to see the occurrence of the IOs within that one second period and then be able to analyze the effect of IO bursts and accordingly the periods of host idle. So the point here is that we collect the metrics on every IO that occurs, but we can do a replay and look at IO sequentiality, bursts, and host idle by controlling the resolution of the capture so that we can zoom in to the appropriate level. Mm -hmm. And we have another question here that we can address. In these real-world software workload application traces, do these include non-media command per, uh, percentages, such as identity and read log page, sleep states, et cetera? So uh, the, the point is, depending on the storage interface and, the, uh, and firmware, this can adversely affect the performance and the quality of service. What do you think about that? So right, so we can't be all things to everybody, and so the IO trace capture captures the logical IOs, and we're not out at the protocol level. However, we can capture non-performance IO commands, such as trim commands, but we can't get down there and look at error commands or other things that are at the protocol level. Mm -hmm. Okay, good point. So if you really look at how these real-world software workloads are affecting performance, I mean, they, effect, they effectively are the system performance itself. And so as we noted, solid-state storage performance is going to depend on how well the storage is going to respond. You know, clearly you can address this using, you know, uh, different types of drives or different performance drives, and, you know, both solid-state as well as rotating media. Obviously here from SNEA, we're, we're mostly focusing on the solid-state aspect of it. But if you look at the characteristics of a solid state drive um, and the characteristics of the workloads running on them, the software workloads are going to be constantly changing combinations of I.O. streams with different queue depths. So these synthetic lab tests can give you performance measures, but they're really not going to show you the absolute performance uh, in comparison. And so Uses, using a synthetic workload to actually make your choice for drive or even determine how your, how your drive or your drive driver software is going to be written um, might not get you the results that you want. The I.O. streams obviously are going to vary by block size, by the read-write I.O.s, by the different set of accesses. And the solid state storage is going to respond differently to random versus sequential, to the various block sizes, to the various I.O.s. You know, this is, so this is why a real-world software workload is going to be um, so important, really getting an understanding of how the system is truly behaving uh, in the wild, so to speak, is really going to give you a much better idea as to how your solid-state uh, drive is going to perform. So these streams, the, the demand intensity, uh, the different uh, the different variances, they're going to determine in large part the storage performance that is provided. What else would you have to say about so with, that, Eden? So with regard to the IO streams, I think everybody knows that SSDs natively perform better with large block sequential reads as opposed to small block fragment writes. When you have a workload, you may not be aware that the IO streams can start out as large block sequential in user space, but as it goes through the software hardware stack, they can be broken up into concurrent random IOs or coalesced or merged with other metadata to give you a totally different IO stream at the storage level. Secondly, demand intensity is an underappreciated uh, impact and a factor of performance. Usually in a real-world workload, the demand intensity is lower than what you have in the lab. Why? Because in the lab, you are 
applying an unlimited stream of IOs to the storage with no restrictions to see how fast my SSD can perform. In the real world, actual workload IO streams are throttled by the application and the software hardware stack. If you were to have 100% demand in the real world, your system would not work. You would have a bottleneck and you wouldn't be able to do anything. So by definition, a good architecture is never going to be at 100% usage. It will be throttled down to some lower level. So when you look at a real-world workload, sometimes people go, hey, how come my IOPS are only 1,500 IOPS? Why do I need a 100,000 IOPS drive? Well, when you look at burstiness and you look at peak traffic and responsiveness, so indicates that the drive probably has a better firmware algorithm for handling garbage collection, small block fragments, and associated traffic that's going to be in that workload. So from the big picture view, remember, IO streams are not what you think they are, and there's a lot more of them. And secondly, demand intensity is constantly changing from very low to very high, and that affects your performance as much as the IO streams. And I think another interesting point to make is the length of the of the, of the workload capture uh, that you do uh, is going to give you uh, different vari variability in your data. So you can capture a five or a ten minute workload, and that's going to give you a really good idea of burst, and that's going to that actually could uh, determine some you know stress performance tests by doing trace captures where you're going to be uh, where you know you're going to have a stress in the system. But actually, doing some of those longer uh, trace captures, like we were referring to a 24-hour 24 24-hour capture before, is actually going to give you the daily performance metrics, and it's going to give you a much uh, better view of your overall activity rather than just your stress level activity. Would you agree? Yes. Um, and we also have a question: Can we get more explanation of demand intensity in comparison to QDEP? So. Q depth, as everyone knows, changes, or maybe you don't know, but it changes up and down the stack. Everybody's measuring Q depth at different levels, and there's different optimizations of different engines that are handling IO commands and managing them as they hand them off to the next layer. So generally speaking, your demand intensity typically refers to the total outstanding IOs that are existing at a particular spot or level in the software stack. Q depth is often looked at as the number of jobs. And all the way down to storage level, it makes a difference whether it's a thread or a queue. So threads are typically jobs and queue depth. I'm sorry, threads are usually users and queue depths are jobs. So I might have four different use cases going on, four threads, and each one has eight jobs or queue depth of eight. So I have four threads, eight queues, that's a 32 outstanding IOs. Further up the stack, there is not usually a distinction between threads and queues as it affects performance. So you're just seeing a total number of outstanding requests being handled by the I.O. scheduler or other activities between user space and storage. This is a very deep and complex uh, area that would require a different webcast and probably a different set of speakers. But it's a good question that, you know, generally speaking, yeah, queue depth is important. You need to distinguish between queue depth at the drive level, which sometimes has to do with native queue depth and 32 and so forth at the storage level, versus I.O. schedulers and queue depth management as I.O.s are handed down through the software layer stack. That's a good explanation. Thank you. So you can see up on the screen now uh, the visualization that we can provide of a real-world software workload. Uh, we can basically show this by creating an I.O. stream map, and that's going to show you the changing combinations of the I.O.s and the metrics over time. And you'll get to see this live as we do get into the demo here in about another five minutes. But you can see that uh, we can me measure at any time in the capture of the I.O. stream probability of occurrence happening in the different uh, color data series. I think the best way to really look at that is to see the sharp black line on the uh, left side where there is obviously a um, very specific I.O. that was done for a short period of time uh, that uh, that really overwhelms the rest of the system. Uh, likely that was the 2 a.m. backup if, uh, if we're looking, at, if I'm looking at the right thing. But these, um, so basically you're going to be able to look at the different IOPS. You're going to be able to look at time over the x-axis uh, of this 24-hour capture. And then we can also look at some of the different secondary metrics that would be coming in uh, to the I.O. capture as it's displayed. 
So if you look at some of the different uh, secondary metrics that we can do, the capture tools that we have, um, you know, can show you I/O stream listed by random or sequential access, by block size, by I/O. Um, we can look at average and maximum response time, different queue depths, and uh, several other metrics as well. And so we can get into the demo and show you uh, some of the different characteristics. But this is a pretty powerful tool. By being able to capture this data and actually look at um, how we're really generating it, you have the ability to see how the system is really interacting and what type, of, what type of things the storage is actually seeing as it's having to do its work. Uh, what else would you like to say around that, Eden? So one of the key things with real-world workloads and captures are you have too much data, not enough data. So typically, if you look at an IO trace, you have gobs and gobs of data, and you don't know what to do with it. So one of the values of this tool is the easy visualization of the pertinent data. Uh, as we'll see in the demo, you can filter the IO stream map to the certain level to see what you want to see. But looking at the two images on the screen now, in the top image, in the previous slide, there was a black line with that spike. That black line was a total IOPS. So you could see that wow. the IOPS spiked at an early point in time and then continued at a flat level. The colors that you see represent the dominant IO streams. So in this case, you see, I don't know, maybe six or ten colors. The top light blue color is all one IO stream. And the gray is another IO stream, the green, and so forth. So by just glancing at this, you can say that, OK, I see probably six dominant IO streams, and maybe there's a whole bunch more at the bottom of the graph I can't really resolve. And further, I can see that the relative percentage occurrence it seems to be pretty constant. I see the blue, gray, green, orange, and purple kind of in a band going across time. But then if you look carefully, you can see these little green spikes that go up periodically all the way from the bottom to the top of the chart. So that green color IO stream I think it's a sequential half k right, occurs periodically. And because it's going up to the top of the screen, on the right-hand side, that's the percentage of occurrence. So if you look at a color, if it were all one color from the bottom of the top of the screen, that would be that IO stream color occurred 100% of the time. If there's two colors, the top half 50 and the bottom half 50, then one stream occurred 50% of the time, one stream occurred the other 50% of the time. So if we take a portion of this map and look at the bands, you can see that it's probably 30, 25, 15, 10, 15, 5 percent of the colors until we hit a green spike, in which case for that point it's probably 80, 90 percent green spike and then 10 or 20 percent of the remaining color. So in this case, I happen to know that this is a GPS map portal and that the workload is pretty constant in terms of its IO composition, meaning that we see the same 8 or 10 IO streams occurring. The thing that changes is the demand intensity, which is the queue depth of users, which you can see on the bottom screen spiking. And you can also see periodically spikes of these sequential half k write activities, which upon closer examination could relate to a specific system or application activity that occurs over time during the day. Very good. So you do have the ability to view these I.O. streams not only overall, but you can actually view them uh, additionally by specific application. So, uh, uh, so by doing that, you can extract the specific I.O. generated by the application even as the system is doing all its separate work. So uh, that allows you to uh, basically look at additionally the, cu the cumulative work no workload of the, of the application itself, the different I.O. streams that are, that are composed around it, um, as, well as, uh, as well as any of the total I.O. streams in comparison to how the rest of the application system is working. So this actually, from a software development perspective, is very useful because it gives you an understanding of all the other activities in the system and how your I.O.s are, uh, are, are represented in that overall activity, which gives some idea in terms of performance tuning or other activities that you might want to uh, analyze before you take your application live to the marketplace. This is also very so, useful for, oh, go ahead, Eden. Yeah, a couple of things about applications. So the kernel assigns what's called a process ID, otherwise known as a PID, P-I-D. So the IOs that are collected have tagged with it a PID, and that PID can be SQL Server, it can be Chrome, it could be Microsoft Office, and oftentimes it's a system. So what happens is you can see the different processes that are occurring. But while you can see, for example, SQL Server process IDs, 
many of the process IDs associated with an application may be buried in the system. So once you load it into RAM, then whatever occurs is seen by the capture tool as a system activity, even though it's a SQL Server. So the main point there is that while I might see 5 million SQL Server IOs, that doesn't mean that I'm seeing all of the SQL Server IOs that occur during the capture. And the second thing that's interesting about process IDs is that with this tool, you can filter the IO stream map by process ID. So when we look at this map, it might be composed of 36 separate process IDs, but I could go and click, I just want to see SQL Server, and then it would redraw or rebuild a map showing only the SQL Server tagged IOs, and that would be, as you can see on the slide, six IO streams that are 78% of the total. Okay, good point. So obviously this is going to be able to tell us a lot of things. We're going to be able to understand the IO stream distribution of the various processes. We're going to be able to understand the changing combinations of the I.O. streams over time, uh, throughput, uh, every, and the average max Q depth, this, uh, the various secondary metrics. You know, we, we can get the different response times as well. This is going to be a really nice tool to be able to, as Eden said, give us so much information that we can then uh, wade through and parse to better understand what we most want in terms of either application development hardware development or system development and deployment into the marketplace. So I think that at a variety of levels, this tool allows you to be able to make more intelligent decisions about how you want to configure your system or configure your device to best be able to respond to the needs of the real world. Um, maybe so the going back to that screen. Though, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go back to that screen. So you see four images there. The upper right image is that IO stream map, and you can see that the IOs that occur over 24 hours are peaks and valleys. So the left-hand spike, that's a 2 a.m. backup, and by color, it's 64K read-write. And then you can see early morning, there's some activity, and then you can see the mountain building to a peak on the right. That's your daily activity. So in the early part of that building pyramid, it's morning boot storm, and then you have daily activities and closing. So that upper right corner shows you the IO activity over time, there are all these different IO streams that occur, 64K read right on the left, sequential half K during morning boot storm, mixed IOs during that big peak on the right. The upper left shows you the average over that full 24 hours, how many IO streams and what percentage occurred. So that's taking the top nine or 10 IO streams and showing you that the most of them were blue, the second most were red and green and so forth, and each one is associated with a specific IO stream. The bottom left shows you response times, both the average response time and the 5.9 quality service of the 99.999% response times over time. And then the bottom right shows you two things. It shows you the IOs that occurred, and then it shows you the green line, which is a change in outstanding IO or the demand intensity. So by lining these things up, you can see that, for example, uh, for that 2 a.m. spike in the morning, I have a big IO spike of green sequential 64K read right in the upper right. Directly below it, you can see that the green Q depth or user demand is kind of low. So a few guys are doing a lot of data transfer. Whereas on the right, with the big peak in that pyramid on the right, there's a bunch of different colors, a lot of mixed IOs, and the green Q depth line is very high. There's 300 users doing a whole bunch of different things. So you can look at these things in a bunch of different ways and look at them in different dimensions. And you know, we'll go ahead and show you some of that stuff when we do the demo. Yeah. So there was a question here in terms of uh, other secondary metrics. Uh, is it possible to track things like IOAT or, uh, or weight based on uh, the various streams? OK, so I am not specifically familiar with IOAT and weight, but we have a one-size-fits-all IO capture tool whose primary purpose is to have as little impact on performance while you do the capture. So therefore, it's limited to some basic metrics that it tracks. We have pay-for tools and other variants that go at higher resolution and track additional metrics, which can have a higher impact on performance, but it's due to the fact that you want to track specific things like compression, uh, deduplication, trims, and so forth. We can also modify the tool and accommodate specific requests as long as they can be seen at the logical level. So as I said before, we don't get down at the protocol level, 
But if there is a logical command that's occurring, then we can track and uh, report on that. Yeah, so realistically here we're dancing the fine line of let's provide a tool for everybody to use that's, uh, that's free of charge and, and you know also allows us to share information versus something that Calypso would do very specifically in terms of delivering uh, very specific metrics back and that's more of a contract opportunity, correct? Uh, yeah, well there's a pay for tool that allows you to do it. So the for free tool is really nice because it's free. Um, but the other side is that you don't get to turn on the advanced metrics and also the IO capture that you take is loaded to the testmyworkload.com website which is a public site. So from a IT and policy point of view, private companies and enterprises often don't allow you to put your company data on a public site. So in that case, we offer you know, private tools, desktop and client servers that allow you to have your own database within your firewall and to do all of your analysis out of the eye of the public. Ah, and thank you. I always is the CPU state waiting for an IO. Oh, yeah. We, yeah, so we, we track the really CPU system usage, IO queues, uh, CPU IO weights, system uses, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we collect all the standard uh, okay. IO statistics. Pretty well, much any about... statistic that is taken by the kernel can be tracked. The thing is that, you know, if you can go on ad infinitum, and then you certainly get everything you want, but now it becomes too cumbersome. So there's a trade-off between granularity and breadth. It's, well, why don't we take about 15 or 20 minutes to actually demo the tool itself? So you can uh, you can uh, share your screen uh, of your system, and let's take a look at all the cool things that this will do. Okay, thank you. So I am showing you an image of a bunch of clouds going by. If you see that, then this is working. This is the testmyworkload.com site. The URL is testmyworkload.com. If you go here you can see demos and you can also download capture applets for Windows, Linux, or Mac. And what you do is if you have a Mac, you click this and then it takes you to the download page. You can click the Mac download. I have a Mac and I've downloaded about a thousand copies so I'm not going to do it. But if you do do it, you get a thing called an IO profiler and when I click on this, I don't know if you're going to see it. Let's see if it comes up. Okay, do you see the IO profiler? Uh, box. So this mm -hmm. tells you you can do a capture. So I'm going to do a five minute capture. I'm going to do the time resolution or the steps at one second. Spatial resolution is the LBA range. So we track the logical block address of the IOs and all the storage area recognized. So this will do it in 1% increments. And then I can do it at the file system, the block, or both. So I'll just leave that block. So when I start this, you have to put in your password. And the most frequently asked question I get is, what is my password? <laughs> and I tell them, just type your password. And then I get another email. I typed Y-O-U-R password, and it didn't work. So it's, <laughs> it's your password. So anyway. I, I, I as my a former customer support person, I feel your pain. <laughs> All right, so we're running a five-minute IO capture, so I'm going to just reduce this. So we're not really doing anything here, but it will. I'm going to show you how it collects and goes up. I could actually open a window and open a YouTube video and hope that it's nothing indiscreet, or we can hope it's something indiscreet. Okay. Uh oh, it's political. We did. Okay. Anyway, Stephen Colbert is running, and make sure the mute is on. Okay, so this will be running in the background. So meanwhile, going back to our demo, um, I can go to a demo capture here, and under the demo there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Example five is a 24-hour retail web portal. So here you can see the same IO stream map that we were showing in the slides. So along the x-axis is time, and along the y-axis is IOPS, and the colors are different IO streams. So when you look at this blue color, that's random 64K read, the gray sequential half K write, and so forth. So as I scroll across this map, the cursor shows me the IO streams and the process IDs associated with that point in time. So at 8.01 AM, we can see that I had five random 64K reads, four of which were SQL Server, and one of which was the system process ID. 
Next, I had 79 sequential half K writes. I had eight random AK reads. I had four random 4K writes and two sequential 64K reads for a total of 35 IOPS. Of those, 330 IOs were random 4K writes. So the IOPS is the IO rate per second. The number of IOs is what's listed by each IO stream. So at this point at 8 in the morning, we have mostly random 4K writes. So as you go along, you can see that the combination of IO streams is changing as I go through time. When I look at this 2 a.m. backup in the morning here, I can hover over it and see that I have 64K reads, 647 of them, and then 248 sequential 8K reads. I can also click this point, and it creates a workload box that says, at this point in time, 83.9% of the IOs are 64K reads. As I go across the full 24 hours, we have what's called a cumulative workload. What it does, it says that let's add up all the IO streams across 24 hours, and then let's display some number of them. So what we do is, over the 24 hours in this lower left-hand box, it says total IOs, 5,038 streams for 4.3 million individual IO streams. So remember, an individual IO stream is a specific random or sequential access of a read-or-write block size. So a random 4K read is one IO stream. A random 4K write is a second IO stream. If I had a half a million each, I still only have two IO streams. So you can see that the number of IO streams is very significant. However, out of 4.3 million IO streams, or I'm sorry, out of 5,000 IO streams, how many dominate the workload? In this case, you can see below here, it says selected six IO streams for 64%. So when I set the stream threshold up here to 3%, what I see is I see every I.O. that occurs at least 3% of the time or more over 24 hours. So if I see 3% of the I.O.s, if I scroll this box up over here, okay. So now you can see that the last I.O. was 64K read, sequential, 3.5%. The next two are a random 8K write and a random 4K read that occurred 2.9% and 2.7% of the time. They didn't make the cut. They're less than 3%. So we only see six streams for 64%. If I change this threshold to 2%, it's going to re- We ran an 8K write and the 4K read. So now I just clicked it. It just rebuilt it. And if we look in the lower left, it's now eight streams for 70%. So what you can do is you can filter the IO stream map by IO stream threshold. The second thing you can do is you can filter this by process ID. So again, remember we said the main activity of this retail web portal is SQL Server activity. But a whole bunch of other stuff occurs. So on the right here, you can see that there are 36 processes from SQL Server to system to W3, WP, XCopy. There are things that sound like an application. And there are things that sound like something that, unless you're a software engineer, you don't know what that they mean. You can Google it and find out, but the point is, is I can clear all of these, and I can say, okay, I just want to see the SQL Server IOs. So when I click SQL Server, which is 79.9% of the activity, when I apply this, it's going to rebuild the map again. So now, when the map is built, I'm going to go across here, and every IO I see is associated with SQL Server. So here you can see every IO, random 64K, sequential half K right, random 8K read, et cetera, et cetera. They're all SQL Server IOs. I can add in the system, or I can actually do something more fun. Let's clear everything and let's do X copy. So now when I do this, here's the X copy over here. I can highlight this, and it says X copy occurred at 2.55 a.m., and it's composed of 66% random 4K reads and 25% sequential 4K reads. So you can see that you can filter or parse the IO stream map by process IDs or IO stream thresholds. The next thing you can do is you can zoom in to see this IO stream map. So this peak looks pretty interesting here. So I think it's control or command. Okay, I got it. So I zoomed in here, and you can see that when I zoom, I can see more clearly what's going on with each step. And in this case, I can pick another metric up here like Q depth, and I can see that, okay, here's my average Q depth, which is the dark line, and here is my uh, max Q depth, which is the dotted line. Okay, so now we can see Q depth is ranging between 8 and 100. So 
Well, you can select a variety of different metrics. So I can unclick all the IO streams to make the map. And now I can see what my response times. So again, you can see my average response time, my max response time, and I can see it by just by IOPS. Or I can say I want to see my sequential half K, and my sequential half Ks are, you know, 29 to 782 response time. Okay, so there's a bunch of stuff we can do here. Um, the next thing we can look at is, let me go back to here. Oh, we can also look at drive one. So if we look at drive one, you can look at this 2 a.m. peak here. This is a backup. It's 64K writes. Okay, if you go back to drive zero, it's 64K reads. So I'm reading from drive zero, and I'm writing to drive one. Now, when you do an I.O. capture, it captures all of the I.O.s that are applied to any logical storage recognized by OS. So in this case, we saw two physical drives. One is a uh, 240... 214 gigabyte drive and one's a 193 gigabyte drive. So you can see drive zero, drive one, or you can aggregate them, not on the public tool, on the private tool, you can do it and see the combination of the IO streams. We have other examples here. So example six is a GPS nav portal. And for the GPS nav portal, it's 24 hours, there's 720 steps at two minute intervals. I can go to drive C, and when this loads, I would just take a glance at the cumulative workload as an easy way to see what's going on, and I want to see what kind of IO streams are occurring and what kind of percentage. That's kind of the first cut we can take a look. Is it large block sequential? Is it small block random? Are they reads? Are they right? So that's one of the key things that you want to look at. So this is going to take a second to load. Meanwhile, so while it, we can look at while it's loading, I was, yeah, while it's loading, I was, I was actually going to get to the question. So uh, you have the ability not only to read these, to measure these workloads, but you can actually replay these workloads, and that gives yes. you the ability to then replay that workload across a various uh, set of devices in order to be able to best determine which device is uh, most performant in the situation or how well it would perform in the situation. Correct. Yes. So I'm looking at the question, an end user can literally use to see what their real world should look like. How could an SSD vendor mimic the real world work and get more real world workload for use in common for use in common benchmarking tools like SIO? Okay, so you're mixing apples and oranges here. So the first case is you capture a workload and you can replay the workload. So what you do is you capture the sequence and combination of IO streams and QDEFs and it makes a test play, a test script called a replay test. And I replay that exact sequence of IO streams. So for example, let's say I take a four-step capture. First step is 50-50 random 4K read write. Second step is 50-50 write. Right? Play that replay So I just program the software to create in the first step 50-50 random 4K read write, and the second step 50-50 random 8K read write, third step 100% sequential 128K read, and the fourth step sequential 8K write. And I, if the tool allows me, I can set the Q depth for each of those I/O streams independently. Now, FIO and DD Bench do not allow you to do that, but other software tools such as Calypso's test software allows you to do that so that every I.O. applied to storage can have its own unique Q depth as well as logical block address if you really want to recreate what's going on. Uh, the second part is, uh, so for use in common benchmarking tools. So as I said, the FIO and SysBench don't allow you to recreate a dynamically changing combination of I.O.s. You would have to create and concatenate an individual script for every step. So if I have a thousand steps in a replay test in FIO, you would have to create 1,000 scripts and just run them uh, end to end. Um, how are you tracking compressibility and duplication if you don't turn on dedupe? Uh, what we do here is we track both at the file system level and at the block I/O level. So at the file system level, we can see the compressibility and we. And then when you get to the block I.O. level, when you want to test storage 
and you compare it to the actual number of bytes to do your deduplication or compressibility uh, ratio. So you can also see it on the source capture if that feature is turned on. And what it does, it takes the time to write the data to the storage and, and see how much data is written on the storage and compare it to the host rights. Mm -hmm. And, and once capture the capture is done, it, yeah, I was going to say, and once the capture is done, it can actually be replayed on any system that you want. So you can replay it on, you can take a single capture and you can actually then replay that using uh, using dummy data on, a, uh, on any uh, system, on any drive. So this is actually a useful way to be able to do comparison tests for various drives or for various system configurations using a workload that you know uh, is going to be happening in your environment. Would you agree? Right. Right. So at the very top level, the use of a real-world capture replay script has a couple of major things. Number one, it can be used to qualify storage. So we capture a 24-hour workload at the data center. We send that replay script to the server vendor. He runs out on the servers. He can see how well the server is performing to his customer's workload. The customer can take that capture and use it for load balancing, for failure analysis, uh, for interoperability, and other items. So he can see, here's my actual workload. How much utilization am I getting on my servers? How many servers should I buy or should I reconfigure my servers? If I'm running different applications on different servers, you know, what's going to be the bottleneck? So there's a variety of things you can use from the data center, hyperscaler end, to analyze your workload. Third, to the SSD vendors that are going to sell SSDs to the server vendors, you can use these workloads to optimize your firmware and optimize your drive design to the type of workloads that occur. Uh, SSDs, the performance is kind of known as 20 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag. You know, you get to have good sequential read or small block write. You get to have good low demand intensity or good high demand intensity. You get to have good read or write performance, et cetera. But do you know what is actually in your customer's workload? Do you know the environment that your SSD is going to go into? Because you can tune your drive to do a whole lot of things, but if you don't know what kind of war he's going into, you don't know what kind of guns to give your soldier. So I wouldn't want to give my soldiers a whole bunch of heavy armor that they're going to go into a really hot desert, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to go to that analogy too far. Will you be sharing the cost of your tools or systems? Yes. I'll share the cost with you. <laughs> No, actually, it's free. You go to testonworkload.com. You can download it. It's free. You contact Calypso, and if you're interested, we work with you for free on a proof of concept. If you want to buy, we have a full price range from a seat license that allows you to have a client desktop version that fits within your firewall, and we can license the seats by volume so that every IT analyst or user in your group can have one. All the way to the other end, we can have an integrated uh, test system that allows you to have hardware software tests using the SNEA uh, PTS spec reference test platform along with full synthetic and real world testing for any kind of storage from block IO, SSD, NVMe type storage to byte addressable in memory, persistent memory type products. So one really good thing about workloads is they apply to any storage. I don't care whether it's persistent memory or it's a HDD or it's an NVMe SSD. It applies at any level of the stack, user space, file system, block I.O., or anything in between. It can be done remotely or directly. We can put the capture tool on the end of a wire. We can go through fabric. We can go through remote. And it doesn't care if it's byte or block addressable. So again, we can do persistent memory or we can do traditional block I.O. Um, yeah. But the key point is that we're that we're discussing here is the tool that you're demoing here, and the tool that we're discussing is actually a free capture tool. What we're really looking for here at Test My Workload uh, is for you to be able to not only capture the traces yourselves, but also provide them up to the Test My Workload site so that others can look at them as well. So this is a great opportunity for us to all gain. We want me to be. Uh, the impartial arbiter here in terms of providing workloads for people to be able to test, replay, and better configure systems. But we need the workloads from you in the first place in order to be able to provide those. Okay, so the capture is done. 
So you can see here that on my captures, I have an account. You can open your account. You have to have an account to see a capture. It doesn't cost you anything. Actually, you don't have to put your real name in, but you should. Uh, but you have to put a real email address in because we have to email you back the keys. But in any case, once you set up your account, you have my captures. So when this capture is done, I could click upload to my workload and it would go there. But I wanted to show you that it creates a file on your system called my, uh, my IO captures. So under my IO captures, I can see all the IO captures that are there. So I'm going to pick the most recent one, which is. You do a few of these, I see. Yeah. What year is this? 2017, 20, 2019, there it is. OK, 7 9. You drag this guy up to here. It's uploaded. Now it's processing. Now it's taking that binary data and creating it. Now it says, OK, here is disk 1 captured on 2019-7-9 at 11.38-12. It's a uh, five-minute capture, 294 seconds. Resolution was one second. There's 294 steps. It was done on Eden MacBook Air local, Mac OS, 8 gigabytes of RAM, one Apple 500 gigabyte SSD. So when I click this, now here's my I.O. stream map. So you can see that from left to right are the I.O.s for the five minutes. I can click descriptions over here. And this tells me my cumulative workload for five minutes was 102 I.O. streams. Five I.O. streams is 77%. If I go down to 0.3%, I get 20 streams is 95%. And here are the I.O. streams. If you look over here, you can see here are my activities. So I can clear these and say, let's see what Skype is doing. Now we apply that, and there's my Skype activity. Or we can look at Chrome, I suppose. So I have to figure out where Because we're playing with YouTube, YouTube after all. So YouTube was inside Chrome. So it's going to show up as Chrome. Yeah. So anyway, this is where actual demos fall apart. Somewhere in here. But anyway, you can pick Demos, your, children, and animals. You know how it works. All right, let's just do all of them and then go across and whatever. So we can zoom in here on the front end. Oops, that's not zoom. There's the zoom. Here's a peak. And you can see it's got varied kernel tasks. There's no real specific IOs that you can see. So here's one Google software up, whatever that is, crash pad, diagnosis, such and such. So you can see that everything we're doing on the big captures is located here. Um, it was pretty easy to just run the capture and upload it. Going back to the demos, uh, again, we have a example one, which is a uh, five-minute capture on a Windows machine. And then we got a five-minute capture on a Mac. And then example three is a bunch of synthetic uh, workload patterns. So you can see sequential 512 read-write with uniform or random data pattern, different kinds of uh, office applications, etc. So if you open this, it will show you different activities run on time when we capture it. So you can see that here's the sequential 512 activity. Here's the sequential 512K write activity with random data. And then the two lines here are my compressibility and duplication rate. So with uniform data, I have a compressibility of 226 and a duplication of 99%. But when I go to random data, those drop down to 1%. So in other words, I can't compress random data, but I can compress uniform data. Over here, you've got different office documents going on. And then you can see in here that we've highlighted things like uh, compressibility, deduplication, and other things. And then over here, you have media files, which are larger block sequential. So anyway, yeah. those are different types of activities. The green storage twig has a uh, 14 IO stream workload. So we ran this. Hey, I want to make sure we, uh, hey, and I yeah. actually want to make sure that we get back and, and ensure that people know we've got about a minute or two to wrap up. But you can okay. see some of the various pieces of the uh, of what we do, and you can tell Eden is uh, is uh, is of course always very interested in uh, in showing off his tool. And, uh, and some of the various aspects of it that you can get.
So just that, and I think we've gone through a lot of this as soon as I as soon as the button works for me. Uh, you, uh, there we go. So the benefits across the industry are going to be, uh, as you can see, uh, pretty uh, pretty broad. Uh, hardware manufacturers are going to be able to build and use and expand their tests. Um, we're going to really be able to tune the driver development of the hardware uh, in order to best match that real world workload. Software developers, um, you can actually provide those workloads for the hardware and for IT so that you get the best tuning of performance. Um, but you can also find race conditions internal to your system and get better understanding of what's going on. And uh, IT organizations, you can provide the workload so that you actually are going to get better components for software and hardware that's going to be able to respond to you as well as make, uh, make the various right choices. So, you know, obviously, um, you being able to provide some of these reference IO capture workloads at testmyworkload.com is really important for us to be able to uh, make the most out of the environment. Um, so there were a couple of quick questions that we can answer. Um, can the traces capture a quest cluster workload or just a single server? Even? Uh, if you can do a cluster workload, you just launch multiple instances of the capture tool, and then you can aggregate the workloads together. And the other question is, have you seen a situation where the I.O. size and the wire does not match what the application request is? Yes, all the time. Uh, how you solve that is you do captures before and after the point of interest, and you can see what's going in and what's coming out. Uh, as we said, the software stack is constantly coalescing or uh, merging or concatenating or splitting IOs uh, as you go along, so you never really know what you're getting. Um, on the wire, also, you're going to see uh, duplication for error correction and transmission uh, quality. Uh, so you can strip those out or see if they're there. Yeah. So clearly, all of this starts with you going to testmyworkload.com. Uh, so we will have, uh, and Eden has a white paper uh, there uh, from Calypso on using the test capture tool. We also have a link available to uh, the SNEA white paper that Eden and I wrote on uh, actually using and contributing to testmyworkload.com. And as Marty referenced before, that's uh, both in English and in Chinese. Um, so what we'd really like you to do is understand your workload, know that understanding your workload is critical. Help us by not only providing workloads, but by analyzing uh, your hardware and software uh, using the capture and replay tools that are available to you at the, at the site. And uh, try the demos. Um, you know, uh, the free capture tools and the analytics uh, at the site in order to be able to better understand what we can provide. SNEA, as the arbiter here, really would like to be able to provide a lot more of this information to the industry overall. And this is something that we'll continue to do. And that, that's why we're uh, reinvigorating this program so that, so that the industry overall can benefit. Um, what, uh, certainly, uh, we would like to say thank you for attending. Um, you know, for more information, uh, you can go. You can get the webcast slides at the link that you see there. Um, you can. You can also uh, download the white paper, how to be part of the real world workload revolution white paper. Oh, we had white paper at the end to make it even harder to say. And then certainly, uh, we will be providing uh, additional answers uh, to the questions at the SNEA blog. And we would encourage you to visit snea.org slash SSSI for more information on solid state storage. So with that, I certainly would like to uh, say uh, thank you to uh, Eden and to Marty, uh, Marty, our moderator, and Eden, our co-presenter, uh, for all the information provided. And Eden, anything you'd like to say? Uh, nope. If you go to testmyworkload.com, if you hit the email response there, I can see it in case you want to get technical, answer questions, technical questions answered or get other questions. We certainly thank everyone for attending and anybody for viewing the replay, and we look forward to talking to you in the future. Great. Thanks, Jim and Eden. And please remember to, uh, audience, please remember to rate this webcast so we can continue to improve. Thanks again for attending. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye.